what is up guys welcome back to the channel australia 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 it's been a minute but we here learning some history of australia now um been kind of on this journey learning a little history and i usually do history learn the history of different countries and stuff and australia we on the list here i know it's been a minute since i've done a video i think the last time i done a video doing like culture shots some funny things type of thing but i do know a little bit just uh with the times the comments and some videos that some of the subscribers sent so i appreciate you guys i said sus, 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 sus. got tongue twisted right there sus, subscriber did it anyway we checking out some history of Australia. y'all hit that subscribe button and this is from the channel history with hilbert so y'all make sure give him a follow subscribe like the video let's check it out hello everyone welcome back history with hilbert here and today i'm making a video about australia in my last video i made a little joke about australia being full of penal convicts and therefore they're all criminals but you know in this one i'm just going to be very serious <laughs> about everything and i promise i won't make any jokes about australia being a penal <laughs> <convict>. <laughs> <What>? ah, <laughs> That's crazy. never mind so this video is the entire history of australia i hope you enjoy The ancestors of the indigenous population of Australia, called the Australian Aboriginals, were one of the first groups of people to leave Africa in search of a new homeland. They did this at some point from 65,000 years ago to 49,000 oh. years ago, with some estimates putting the first humans in Australia at 125,000 years mm. ago, which is... In fact, the first Australians are so old that at the time they were coming into the new continent and making a home there, there were still Neanderthals running around in Europe. On the chart of old things, the first Aussies really are right up there. Now, the first Australians would have come into... This list is wild. At least that first one. <laughs> old things, the first Aussies really are right up there. History with now, the first Australians would have come into the continent through Southeast Asia, and it's thought that they would have used islands to go island hopping until they managed to get to Australia, as crossing an ocean was very difficult, especially in this era before sail technology. The Australians who first came into Australia would have had a different situation than today, because back then sea levels were a lot lower, which allowed people like the ancient Siberian to cross over the Bering Strait into the Americas as well as peoples coming into Australia to cross into Australia and New Guinea wow. as New Guinea and Australia are linked together by what's now the Sahul Shelf which is underwater back then because of ice ages and different sea levels this was all above water and there was a continent called Sahul which they could walk Sahul. over to get to Australia. Today's Aboriginal population of Australia is most closely related to the Papuans from New Guinea. And a very interesting thing mm. about both the Australian Aboriginals and the indigenous population of New Guinea is that they share somewhere around 5 to 6% in some cases of their DNA with another subspecies of human called wow. the Denisovan man who originated somewhere Denisovan? and lived in Siberia and they must have bred and intermingled with this other species of human when the aboriginals were coming into Australia through the landmass of Sahul when they lived in Guinea in Papua and the Papuans have a slightly higher than the Aboriginals. They have slightly higher mm. DNA from the Denisovan man, which again suggests that this theory of the movement into Australia is correct. Now as wow. well, when Aboriginals came into Australia, they were sharing the continent with Australian megafauna, which are these huge things like, uh, I think, woolly rhinoceros and things like the giant kangaroos, as well as other things. And one very interesting thing about the Aboriginal art is it's some of the oldest art on Earth. And I know you're meant to be careful mm. when you're saying art with Aboriginal things, but I'm just going to go for it. Um, and actually some of the wall carvings, which are... Okay, I think I did a video... Um kind of talking about the aboriginal people and i think there was a cave the the person went inside the cave and found uh something like this as well to find that's very interesting still that it's still or here possibly today possibly the know? oldest in the world are thought to show these giant emu like creatures called genyornis and they were essentially Whoa. three times as large as an emu 
and you can see that they are absolutely massive and they have been drawn on the walls so the first aboriginals to come into australia were inhabiting a really alien landscape and it again goes to show how long ago this was that might have just been a dinosaur gosh that thing is big i could just imagine like all these years ago the type i me personally i think there's some interesting sea creatures out there but just imagine the land creatures from back then. In a oh really my goodness. alien landscape. Things and it huge. again goes to show how long ago this was. If we look at a language map of the Aboriginal languages of Australia, we see that one family, the Macro Pamanyungan languages, is much larger and covers most of the Australian subcontinent. Whereas in the north, you have a collection of other smaller oh. languages being spoken. Now, there are hundreds of Aboriginal languages, and these are simply the larger language families. Now, if we look at this and we see that in most of the subcontinent, one language is spoken or one group of languages is spoken. And then we see in the north that many are spoken. It would suggest some sort of colonization in the north. And actually, if we look at the DNA of Aboriginals, we also find something very interesting. Now, Australia, the Aboriginals are very diverse and there are many different groups with many different customs and languages, as we've just seen. But actually, if we look at the DNA, we find that especially in the north, certain groups have a very small amount of East Indian DNA. Mm. which is thought to be from around wow. 5,000 years ago. Now, there are two explanations as to how it got from Eastern India to Australia. One explanation says that the genes were simply slowly transmitted from one place to another through the East Indies onto New Guinea and oh, then well, into Australia to... by simply bumping the genes along with each generation. Whereas the other theory suggests that there would be a direct migration from India to Australia. And although both theories have their advantages and disadvantages, it is interesting that one of the northern groups, the Warlpiri group of Aboriginals, has some of the highest East Indian DNA wow. in them today, and their language is also rather different to some of the other Aboriginals. So it's interesting to see what would have happened then with this influx of DNA. And that's always interesting when we get to DNA. Uh, I know I've been watching uh, the Swedish show Osphosphere, and it's just about them connecting with their ancestors and stuff, ancestors and stuff like that. And I, I be wanting to take that DNA test thing just to see, because I know my, I don't know too much about my great grandparents, mom, dads, and you know all that. All I know is, especially on my great grandpa's side, I don't know too much, but I know my great grandma. I think her mother was Indian. I, I believe at least that's what I was told. But I'll be one of this. When you go back and doing the ancestry things, it you start wondering how everything just came about. You know, you wonder about. Who, why you are who you are today type of so thing. So it's interesting to see what that would have happened then with this influx of DNA. And despite which theory is correct, it doesn't matter because it still means that there was some form of mixing with the outside world because the genes had to have come to Australia somehow. Mm. And, but apart from this, Australia and the Aboriginals remained very, very secluded and isolated from the rest of the world, which has given rise to such an interesting and diverse group of languages, peoples and customs. Now, it's actually also at this time, about 5,000 to 4,000 years ago, that the dingo, the Australian wild dog, comes into Australia. So this, again, oh. would perhaps suggest a migration of some kind. It's in a similar time frame that new tools start to be introduced and used in Australia. And about 4,000 years ago, which is also in the same sort of time frame, it's thought that the ancestor of most of the languages being spoken by the Aboriginals, the Pamanyungan languages, that that was created around 4,000 years ago. Dang. And then it expanded, which could explain why it had become so important and so widespread throughout Australia. However, there is hardly a genetic trace of these migrants. They've been called ghost migrants before and ghost people because they left a profound impact 
on Australian society with the new language that was being spoken by most of the Aboriginal peoples, new tools being introduced, new animals like the dingo being introduced. And yet, genetically, we find very little evidence. Contrast that with the Anglo-Saxon mm. migration when the language was changed, when new customs were brought over. Then you do find a massive genetic imprint on the English people. Yet the Aboriginals, there's hardly anything there, which is really interesting. But how could a situation like this have arisen? And why isn't there more of a genetic trace for such an important migratory group that had such a profound impact? Where did they come from? And where did they go? One theory would be that there was a changing climate and that the availability of resources meant that new technologies had to be developed. Mm. Say that one animal species died out, then the aboriginals would have to move on to get a different food source and they would have to develop new technologies to do this. Another possibility is that there was language evolution through climate change, which would again be backed up by the first theory. Now, there's been a very interesting study into this. I'll make a video about this in future, that about how different climates stuff. generally tend to see similar sorts of languages in tones and how many consonants are used. And it's possible that if 4,000 to 5,000 years ago there was a shift in climate, there could be a shift in language. Although this doesn't really mm -hmm. explain why there is so much throughout most of Australia and, you know, all these diverse little pockets of language families up in the north. As well, it's possible that the population increased to a critical mass and innovation would then have to be going forward because if you've got the maximum amount of people for the lifestyle, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle they were living in, they would have to adapt to new situations oh, to true. the larger population. Uh, and as you can see, as time goes on nowadays, you have to adapt to, cause I was just thinking just how times were, and I'm going by, you know, time period in the 80s, time period in the 90s, early 2000s. You just see how everything just changes, how the time just changes, things that you used to see. I remember there's certain cars that I used to see when I was little. You can't even, you don't even see them nowadays, and it's just cars, so just imagine five thousand years ago what life looked like versus now. like that's you just gotta adapt with it as pretty much most of the aboriginals didn't live by agriculture they were hunter gatherers so of course you can only sustain a much smaller population without yeah. agriculture for the rest of their history up until the arrival of the first europeans in the 17th century it's thought that Australia's only other contact to the outside world might have been with Makassan fishermen from the East Indies who would trade with some of the mm. Aboriginal tribes in the north. But apart from that, they were completely isolated. It is interesting again to see in the Aboriginal art that they depicted this. And wow. after this, the next people they would find in boats would be the first white people they would ever clap eyes upon. Now for the rest of this video, I'm not going to be talking about the Aboriginals. I know that Aboriginal history doesn't end when the Europeans come in. They still went on, they still endured, and Aboriginals are still around today. And I'm going to make a few dedicated videos to different aspects of their history and culture in the future. But to be honest, this is the Aboriginal history that I find most interesting and I hope you found interesting as well. Whereas the that rest is really rather depressing. Um, as is with many native histories uh, after the arrival of Europeans, which is a shame. But I'm, I'll probably make a few videos about that topic as well. But do keep in mind that I've got a lot of out. history to talk about in this one, a lot of different things, and I hope I've given a pretty good hearing to uh, the part of uh, Aboriginal history that I find most interesting, which is this early stuff uh, in the video. So yeah, no more Aboriginals in this video. That was some interesting things right there. Uh oh, the Dutch is coming, the Dutch is coming. Oh, what's that flag again? Hold on. Red, white, and blue, horizontal stripe flag. <laughs> Let's go to my most trusted source of information. And the red bits on top. Uh, that's it there. Which one's that then? Not flag the Dallas flag. The Kingdom of the, the Netherlands. Kingdom of the Netherlands. And what's this I see? The anthem. Oh. They got a... To explain why the Dutch discovered Australia, I'm first going to have to look a little bit at the context of the VOC, the Verenigd Oost-Indische Compagnie, 
or the United East India Company. Now, the FEOC had a headquarters in Batavia, which is now called Batavia. Jakarta in Indonesia. And from Indonesia, they had to travel back to Amsterdam and the Netherlands and vice versa to get to oh uh, the Spice the Islands, to the Dutch East Indies and the lands beyond, which took a very long time. Now, there was, luckily enough, a very clever and very good seaman called Hendrik Brouwer. And Hendrik Brouwer discovered a current and where the wind is very strong, very strong westerly winds called the Roaring Forties. And essentially, if you went down this lane and you were going from west to east, then you would get a massive boost because you've got this wind in the back. And remember, this is the time of sail, so you needed a good wind. And this would really help with shortening the voyage. So he invented or discovered what's called the Brouwer route, which is wow. then instead of going around and up Africa on the other side and okay. across and around India to get to the East Indies, you would instead go from the Cape of Good Hope, which was a Dutch um, uh, replenishing station for ships. You I can only imagine the thought process on, you know, just the voyages going through... Cause I'm just just thinking just how it was just going up here and around. Uh, that's a lot of extra work. You'd go that's straight across the Indian Ocean at, at 40 degrees latitude, which is where the Roaring Forties gets its name. And then once you got to the Amsterdam Islands, you would go northeast and head for Jakarta or Batavia, as it was called then. However, it was very easy to, if you did miss the Amsterdam Islands, you would keep going in that easterly direction, and then you would crash into the western coast of Australia. Mm. And this happened to a lot of Dutch Feose ships. And it's true that this happened to a very famous case, uh, the ship being called the Batavia. And the Batavia was shipwrecked off Australia's western coast in 1629. Oh. And it's quite famous because the survivors started to murder each other once they were shipwrecked on an island off the western coast. Although I do what? believe that some managed to make it out alive. However, not all of them died Why because it's very interesting other? in Western Australia, you have Aboriginal peoples with much lighter skin, or well, some of them at least, some with blonde yeah. hair and other traits of Europeans. And these, as well as having stories told by the elders wow. that there were Dutch mariners, are the descendants of probably Aboriginal women and Dutch mariners who uh, survived being shipwrecked and then were integrated into the Aboriginal communities. So that's another interesting thing mm. there. Now, they weren't the first Dutchmen to get to Australia. And in fact, the first Dutchman to set foot, or the first European even, to set foot in Australia was Willem Jonsson in 1606 in his ship called the Doufkin, of which this is a replica. This is also the first map that was ever made of Australia, although only a tiny part of it was mapped. It wouldn't be until a little later what? that the Dutch were able to make another map. See, see what it did there? It's called <laughs> Abel Dussman. Abel, Abel to make another Dussman. map. <laughs> the Dutch name for Australia, which comes from the Latin for southern land, Terra Australis, was New Holland, named after the Dutch provinces of the same name. Ridiculous, right? Just remember that its neighbour is still named after a Dutch province. New or did you think it was named after a Danish island? Some of the Dutch names for the islands in the region <laughs> were then New Hollands, which was Australia, Nederlands, India, which is today Indonesia, New Guinea, which is New Guinea, and New Zealand, which is New Zealand, and still is. Mm. New Zealand. Zealand. Britain's naughty, 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 Britain, naughty, naughty. Thanks to a boom in the British population in the 1740s, many people grew up and lived in dire poverty in Britain's oh, cities. Dang. Many punishments were inflicted upon people for committing crimes related to poverty, and many people were either killed or sent away as convicts. Now, in the beginning, most of these convicts would be sent to the Americas, to Maryland and Georgia, which were both British penal colonies in the Americas. But after the 1770s and 80s, when America became an independent country, the British needed somewhere new to send their convicts. So, in 1788, they set up the first penal colony in Botany Bay in Australia. Okay, I think I've heard a little bit about this, actually. And this is about essentially the where they would send the people who committed crimes where conviction was a possible punishment. 
So many people were sent over to Australia as convicts, which is what I made the little joke about in the previous video. Now, there are a lot of amazing stories of people who made really interesting escapes. For example, William Buckley, who is shown here, who escaped from the penal colony and went to live oh, with wow. an Aboriginal tribe. And this image actually here on the right is a drawing made by an Aboriginal man from stories told down about his escape and how he came to live with them. Although he did later on wow. become reintroduced into Western society after he was pardoned from uh, obviously escaping and from the crime which got him convicted in the first place. Another interesting escape mm. is the Kapler escape, which is when, and I'll pronounce it right this time, thank you to whoever it was who uh, corrected me in, in a previous video, uh, when Fenian Irish rebels uh, escaped from the penal colony when it was a whaling boat sailed right the way from Great Britain to Australia, picked up six Irish prisoners and made a dashing getaway. Uh, the Fenians wow. and Irishmen were quite often uh, a large group of the convicts in Australia because Ireland was rebelling a lot at this time, so many of them were Irish. Mm. Now, something else related to this That's is the 1804 Castle Hill Rebellion, in which many of these Irish rebels instigated a rebellion against the colonial government. And at a battle that was called the Second Battle of Vinegar Hill, the First Battle of Vinegar Hill had been fought in, I believe, the 1798 Rebellion, Wolf Tone's Rebellion in Ireland, uh, and like that first battle, the mostly Irish convicts were defeated by British uh, colonial forces there. Now, there weren't only at this stage convicts in Australia, there were also free settlers. And actually, the free settlers really didn't like the fact that so many convicts were being sent because it's like having a huge prison as your neighbours, <laughs> except they're just walking around pretty much freely in the landscape. In 1851... Which is interesting, so they just sent people just to... If you was a convict, you just got sent somewhere. Not locked up, Gold nothing. was discovered and a gold rush happened in Australia. So lots of immigrants came in from various countries. Quite a few Americans, Chinese and British immigrants came to mine this gold and hopefully get wealthy. And this really helped to boost the Australian population, especially because mm -hmm. it wasn't just convicts who were living there. Initially, the relationship between all these miners and the British colonial government in Australia wasn't very good. The colonial government wasn't very happy with all these people coming into Australia. They feared that this would bring about a lot of lawlessness, which it really did, as with the miners in California in 1849. Mm. Now, what they did was they forced the miners to get a mining license, which would cost them money, as well as hindering them in other ways. So many of the miners started to rebel. Now, the relationship Dang. went from bad to worse when a Scottish miner called James Scobie was killed in the Bentley Hotel and the murderer was acquitted. Now, the rebels gathered outside the Bentley's hotel and they burnt it to the ground. Wow. The rebels formed the cool. Ballarat Reform League and swore allegiance to the new flag which showed the Southern Cross. This could, if it had been successful, have been the start of an Australian revolution and it's often heralded as something that was the start of democracy in Australia and a revolution for mm. the people and by the people. However, the rebellion was crushed at the Eureka Stockade which the rebels had put up and uh, the British were triumphant over them and the, the rebellion collapsed. Wow. Yeah, this has been some interesting stuff. Federation. British colonial rule, Australia was made up of several states and territories, each with a different British. colonial government. Now in 1901, the British allowed the Australians to vote for federation, which would mean centralisation under one government, an Australian government, and which would then lead to independence. In 1901, the states did indeed vote for federation, and Australia became an independent nation in its own right. What's interesting is actually that for a while Fiji and New Zealand were also included as part of this. New Zealand was for a while simply an extra part of New South Wales. But in the end, New Zealand didn't hold the vote for federation, which is ultimately why it's not a part of Australia today. I'm not going to lie. Uh, I know I've done many videos. on Aust I always thought New Zealand was a part of Australia, but you know, now that I know, I know, but this was just me not having the knowledge not being taught, you know, you just knew. I don't even think they, I don't remember New Zealand being mentioned too much when I was in school. I knew Australia, 
but if New Zealand was mentioned, it sounded like it was they were saying it was within Australia. Now, in the First World War, the Australians nonetheless fought beside their British and Allied counterparts against the Al the Central Powers. Now, the Australians and New Zealanders made a part of the Anzac Corps, which was especially famous for its service in Gallipoli when the British and other Allied forces tried to attack the Ottomans through the Dardanelles Straits, but which ended in failure despite the best efforts of the Anzacs. Now, this next part isn't really a thing that's talked about often with Australian history because it's just such a horrible thing that no one really wants to bring it to discussion. Now, it's been known by a few different names, and one is the Australian Civil War, because it really was a conflict, a terrible, dreadful conflict, where brother fought against feathered brother. So I'd just like to have a few moments to all the people involved in that oh, awful, awful I'm conflict. Silent. I don't even know if I should be laughing or Despite what. Despite being defeated in the Great Emu War of 1932, the Australians were able to hold the expanding Japanese imperial power at bay in the Second World War and help the Allies to defeat the Axis. Alright everyone, so thank you very much for watching this video which has been about the history of Australia. Now you might be wondering, why did I randomly make a very random and very weird video about the history of Australia? Well, the reason is that my fifth largest demographic of watches are from Australia, so I thought mm. I'd bless them all with this nice video dismantling their history piece by precious piece. So I hope the Aussies precious in the piece. audience have enjoyed this video, and I might make a few more videos for people who uh, are high up in my demographics as a little thank you. And just before watching, or watching, uh, making this video, I have checked the amount of subscribers and actually we have reached over 10,000 subscribers, which is absolutely oh, amazing. Wow. Although I've got a special... 10,000 subscribers. Yeah, this was good. Um, History with Wilbur. Definitely going to subscribe, check out more. Yeah, Australia got some very interesting history. They really do. Um, I'm going to have to check out more. Let's see. They do have some other documentaries and stuff. These things are long. I ain't even going to lie to y'all. These things. Y'all see it. You almost divided Australia. I'm going to have to check that one out next. I'm going to have to check that one out. That look interesting. But yeah, I was looking at the history of Australia. And some of these are barely long. Hopefully y'all made it to the end. But I was like, I need to get back on. Learn about Australia. Why not start? with some history so we got some good history here and so much more that you know of course i wasn't taught in school so much more out there that you know some people might miss per video by the video so you know different people got different history and different artifacts different facts and stuff about the different countries so but i just know this was a lot i knew a few things just probably heard it in a few videos and stuff i didn't know a lot which is good that I didn't know because now I got the chance to hear it and see it for myself. So now got a little bit more information. There's some things I do want to go into you know, deep detail in about Australia, but this was good. This was great. Shout out to Hilbert. Y'all make sure y'all subscribe to his channel. Hey, subscribe to my channel. Y'all hit that subscribe button. I do have an Australia playlist. You can add some videos to it so I can check out some more videos, but that's all I have. Y'all be blessed, be the best to be you. I'm out.